Okay. So um, what's, what's original sin as you look at this? Um, it defines it there. Yeah, that's original sin. So when we talk, the, use the term original sin, what we're talking about is the, not Adam's actual first transgression. Um, I think it's a confusing term. That's why I'm explaining it here. Uh, you know, when, when you hear original sin, you think, oh, the, the one, the sin Adam did when he, you know, took the bite of the f forbidden fruit. But original sin in theology is, is speaking to our corrupt nature, our sin nature that we're, that we're born with. So you see that there in this, um, in this sentence there, the corruption, line four there, the corruption of his whole nature, which is commonly called original sin. All right. Is that, is that a term yeah. in the Bible? No. Original sin, no. Um, For the want of original righteousness, that's the guilt of Adam's first sin. So do we have original righteousness in Jesus? Or is that a completely different concept? We have credited righteousness from Jesus. Okay. Um, so Paul talks about it as a righteousness from God, um, Romans five and, um, maybe second Timothy, I was just reading it the other day as well. He talks, talks about that, a righteousness that we've received from God as a gift. Um, yeah, good question. Good. Any other questions? All right. Okay, <clears throat> so we've been looking at um, Gog and Magog from uh, where in the Bible? Revelation. Both, yeah, so what, what two places that we see Gog and Magog in the Bible, just two. What's, what's the Old Testament place? Ezekiel 38 and 39. Yeah, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And what's that talking about? return of Israel or of the Israelites to the land. Okay, so Israel returns from their Babylonian exile back to the land, and Ezekiel writing in exile, during exile from Babylon, tells them what? In the future you'll be confronted by this multinational army. Okay, so when you come back to the land, uh, a multinational army in the likes of Gog, who was someone who lived like 120 years before Ezekiel. <laughs> will come, gather, gather the nations with him, and they'll all come against God's people. And they'll surround God's people, coming from, um, that. if you can think of a map of Israel from the north, uh, uh, from the north, uh, like up from Turkey, where, where Gog actually was, um, and then the east, uh, Babylon, Assyria, and then from the south as well, uh, Egypt coming up and put, like Libya, uh, coming up and surrounding God's people. And what would God do for his people when they had returned from the promised land and this multinational army led by this Gog figure? Uh, what would he do for his people then? Yeah, accomplish a great victory for them. Um, and the nations would see that the God of Israel is the, the God of gods, uh, that he's the true God, and God would be led by their son of David king in a great victory. Um, over this. Uh, does this end up happening? No. Yep. No, it doesn't happen. And why Why not? The Israelites weren't good enough. Good. good. Unfaithful. <laughs> okay. There's unfaithfulness among Israel. And, and what? Do we, and so the plan changes. And what do we call, call that? That's because of what? Inter yeah. Inter <laughs> uh, intervening historical contingencies. Things come into play. And God, God uh, responds to faithfulness and unfaithfulness per Jeremiah 18, where he tells us, this is how I act towards you. If I declare disaster on you and you repent, I won't bring the disaster, like in Nineveh. Uh, but if I declare blessing on you and you uh, turn wicked and go after other gods, then I will reconsider the blessing that I had promised to you. And so we don't know exactly all that God knows the million things that change between Ezekiel's uh, foretelling of this great battle and when the people get back and the battle doesn't happen. A million things have changed in history, but God works it out in his justice and faithfulness to all that. And, and um, 
So that all gets modified very much. There's no multinational army that really comes against God's people, though they do see um, people when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, Sanballat and others that come against God's people, halt the, the rebuilding of the temple for a while, and then halt the rebuilding of Jerusalem for a while. And so it's, it's a modified fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39. There are other nations that are badgering, uh, persecuting, um, coming after God's people. Um, but it's not like this big, glorious battle where God's people have great victory. Okay, um, So that's Ezekiel 38 and 39. Where's the other place in Scripture that talks about Gog and Magog? Revelation. Revelation 20. Okay, so let's go ahead to Revelation 20. And so uh, John um, and God giving this message through John in Revelation 20 um, uses this Old Testament context um, uh, to communicate uh, what will happen at the second coming. Uh, what will the second coming be about? And so when we get to chapter 20, verse um, 7, um, let's... Um, Faith, would you read that for us? Um, so, Revelation 20 and verse 7. Okay. So, this is talking about, you know, after the thousand years, which we've established up here is our era. Okay. It's not a thousand years exactly. We're, you know, we're a thousand years past that. Um, we're 2,000 years past the ascension of Jesus. Uh, but... Uh, we, we know in the same context, 2 Peter 3, talking about the second coming, um, we know that the people then, in AD 67-ish, when 2 Peter's being written, that there were people in the church mocking those in the church who believed that Jesus was coming again. That's half of what 2 Peter's about. And, and Peter says, don't you know, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Um, and, and he's not slow in fulfilling his promise. Uh, but, but to him, the passing of years, you know, a thousand years to him, who's always existed and always will exist, a thousand years to him is like this. To us, you know, for Peter, who was whatever, 70 years old at that time, you know, a thousand years is huge. But to the Lord, a thousand years is like for us what a day is. Uh, and so he says, just be patient. Uh, people were mocking too. This is Second Peter 3. People were mocking as well during the days of Noah when he was building the ark. And, and they were saying, God's not coming in judgment, Noah. You're wrong. Uh, but he says, but God did come in judgment. And he, he judged the whole world with a flood of water. Just like that, he will come again and he will flood the whole world with fire. And he'll purify the earth with fire and bring in a new heaven and a new earth. Think about Noah. You know, it's a renewed heaven and a renewed earth through water. But with Jesus, it's a renewed heaven, renewed earth uh, with fire that is purified all. Um, so a thousand years are over. Um, Satan's released from his prison. And what's he do? Joyce, can you read verse 8? Okay, so verse 8, he, he, this is where he refers back to Ezekiel. And, and he says, Satan will do what Gog did, like with Magog. You know, come, Gog will come with Magog, and, and there'll be this multinational army um, that comes against God's people. Uh, so it's, it's, now it's, it's Satan instead of Magog, but Satan in the place of Gog uh, there. Um, go out and deceive the nations multinational army in the four corners of the earth expression of from everywhere east north southwest everyone's coming um like gog and magog to gather that you know footnote ezekiel 38 and 39 that's what john's saying okay this is what this is like um to gather them for battle 
um, and a number of the like sand of the seashore. So you see the same picture that Ezekiel gave to us in 38 and 39, that this multinational army who was as numerous as the grains of sand um, would come against God's people and, and surround, surround them. Um, Jim, can you read the next verse, verse 9? He marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loved. The fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Okay. So again, this is the Ezekiel 38 and 39 um, picture here. We have multinational army coming and surrounding God's people, coming up from the south, Egypt and, and Libya, coming from the east, uh, Elam, Babylonia, coming from the north, um, Magog and, and Elam, up the earth. <laughs> or uh, Lydia, you know, Lydia and Magog coming up. And, and so just surrounding and surrounding ultimately the city of Jerusalem, Ezekiel 38 and 39, um, and, and God's people there, but then there would be this great victory. But same, same thing, same picture. We see Ezekiel 38 and 39, while originally meaning a literal army that would surround Jerusalem after the exile, um, now is uh, also, like the rest of the Old Testament, becomes a foreshadowing of what God accomplishes in Jesus that we read about in the New Testament. And uh, so um, we had talked about um, how things get fulfilled in Jesus in three, sta in three stages. And what, what do we call those three stages? Yeah, so we got the I, that's the inauguration. Yeah, inauguration of the kingdom, continuation of the kingdom, and then consummation of the kingdom. And so here at the inauguration of the kingdom, which is Jesus saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Son of David is here. The inauguration of the kingdom. The re-upping of the kingdom of David. Uh, and, and why Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. Because David was, Solomon was, Hezekiah was. Jehoiachin was. They were the anointed Messiah to kings. And so Jesus is that. John the Baptist anoints him as king. Um, Paul talks about that, calls Jesus ha having been anointed, referring to John the Baptist, baptism of him. Um, and so uh, where, where do we see this picture of the nations surrounding, I'll give you a hint, the son of David uh, in the New Testament? Yeah, at the cross. So at the cross, you've got Jesus surrounded in Jerusalem, this multinational city, certainly by Romans and Jews who have lined themselves up now against the son of David. The Jews are no, as, if you're a Jew, if you line yourself up against Jesus, you're no longer God's people. Because God's people are under David. If you want to excommunicate yourself from God's people, get out from under David. If you want to separate yourself from the blessing God gives to his people and the protection God gives to God's people, get out from under the son of David because that's who God blesses his people through. That's who he protects his people through as he lines it up in the Davidic covenant, which is found in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. Uh, and so you've got this multinational you know, army surrounding, you know, literal, literal Roman army there. Um, uh, surrounding um, the, the king of God's people there. Um, how about in the continuation of the kingdom? So the continuation of the kingdom is, is when? Now. now. Yeah, uh, the, uh, Jesus is still our king. Um, where is he king from? Heaven. Heaven. Heaven, yeah. Is he sitting on a throne up there? Yep. Yes. Sure is. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3 and, and uh, uh, Ephesians 1. And so Jesus is reigning over his kingdom now from heaven, um, and it's uh, uh, wherever people claim him as king. Okay, so wherever on earth somebody is claiming Jesus as king, that's Jesus' kingdom. So his church all over the world is his kingdom, and he's not limited to a, ge a geography, uh, but he's in heaven above, reigning over all on the earth, um, who have been you know, of the nations who have made this, been made disciples of him who are uh, Matthew 28 disciples of him uh, who are Philippians 3 20 citizens of heaven where our king is 
Okay, so that's our citizenship. And so um, in the continuation where the church on earth is um, following their heavenly king, uh, following his laws, um, being faithful to him, seeking his glory, paying our tribute to him. That's what your tithes are. Uh, paying our tribute to him, to honor him, to glory him, to glorify him. We come together for worship to say, how great is our king? How great are you, Jesus, our king? That's what we're doing. We're coming into his throne room and we're, we're declaring that. How is, how, is the, um, how is this idea of Gog and Magog occurring right now in the continuation? How has it occurred since shortly after Pentecost to until Jesus comes back? Persecution. Yeah, persecution of the church. The world hates you, Jesus says. So the world, you know, now, just draw a little church here. Isn't that great? Um, <laughs> the world is around the church, um, hating the church for its faith in Jesus. Uh, so Matthew 5, you know, 11 and 12, you know, the, the world hates you. If you persecute, rejoice and be glad for so the prophets were persecuted before you. Or, or 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So now the world is against us. So scripture says you're in the world, but you're not of the world. The world is coming against the church, persecuting the church in various forms all over. And so that's Gog and Magog today. That's how that is fulfilled today in the, in the middle sea, as we call it. Um, and then in the final sea, this is what we're looking at. The consummation, when Jesus returns, um, we, what do we call the, the final persecution where the nations of the earth surround the church, the camp, the camp of God's people, um, uh, uh, to persecute us? What do we call that? Final battle. Final battle. Yeah, and so final battle is, is um, you can't draw that? Yeah, <laughs> when Jesus Jesus comes down uh, from earth and there's this final battle and John is communicating to us, this is like Gog and Magog. Uh, don't, don't fear when the nations rise up uh, in this, uh, whatever form it's going to be, we don't have much detail. Uh, don't fear about this because it will be like Ezekiel talked about. Remember Ezekiel, Gog and Magog? John says. Remember Ezekiel, Gog, remember Ezekiel, Gog and Magog? What happens in this battle when the whole world comes against God's people? God defeats them. Right? Glorious victory. That's Ezekiel 38 and 39. That's what Gog and Magog means. Glorious victory despite appearances that an army from all over the world, surrounds God's people with troops as numerous as the sands of the sea, uh, seashore, um, that God wins in glorious victory, and he is glorified, and his people are rescued. Okay, and so that's, that's what happens when the thousand years are over. When our era is over, um, we've got this um, final battle um, that, uh, that Gog and Magog... Um, had foreshadowed, except Gog is, is Satan, and Magog is representative of the whole world, or this multinational force that comes uh, against Jesus and his people, which is what we were reading about in Revelation 16. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, Bill. So, as you said in the, um, in the middle part, when they're surrounding the church, it's not a geographical, specific geographical location. The church is worldwide. Yeah. Likewise, you're saying here in Revelation 20 that it's not a, a specific, it's not Israel and Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. And so we, we recognize where the, where the foreshadowing connects and where it doesn't connect. And just like the foreshadowing in the Old Testament of God's people, um, being gathered together, worshiping him in distinction of all the world that worships other gods. We recognize in the New Testament that that's no longer the case. God's people are all over the world. They're disciples of, of every nation worshiping God scattered. And this is what Peter calls the church in, in 1 Peter 1. 
you know, elect strangers scattered throughout the world. Um, and, and, and so just as, just as that's, just as we recognize that, that the church is not gathered in one place, it's not a political nation with a political king reigning on a physical throne in a city on the earth. Same thing when Jesus comes back, there'll be people from Australia and um, Japan and uh, Norway and Colombia and Canada and the United States who are, are, are gathered against there rather than being a time where the church all gets uh, flights to Jerusalem <laughs> and geographically gets in one place. Yeah, Bill. Because all the churches I've ever been in, right. the I, uh, the inauguration, yeah. <laughs> it was basically the I in Israel. It's saying Israel is the plot yeah. of land. This land is mine. God gave this land yeah. to me. And the whole world surrounds it. Yeah. And Jesus came to Israel, to the Israelites, preached to them first. So there's this focus on Israel. Yeah. And then you would think that um, ever since then, Israel's been persecuted, the Holocaust and all right. that, and the scattering yeah. and all that. And so that's why I think churches these days look at the last uh, consummation as being Israel. Yeah. That's been ground zero for uh, millennia is what yeah. they're trying to preach. Yeah, that's right. And so whether you're in a charismatic church or a dispensational church, that's what Bill is describing. You know, that's that's what you're hearing. And that's, you know, that's 90% of the United States. If you go in a Christian bookstore, that's what you're going to hear. That this stuff speaks of uh, a physical land and the Jews today. And what that is, you want to hear a fancy term to impress your friends, that's under-realized eschatology. So that's... <laughs> That, that's that's not understanding that Jesus see, see and that's what crucified Jesus they the Jews believed that the fulfillment um, of the return of the Davidic king after the exile had to be a physical political king reigning on a physical throne from Jerusalem in a palace like the Sol Solomon's palace um, ridding the promised land, the physical geography of the promised land, ridding that of all foreigners, like the Romans. And so when Jesus was nice to the Romans, they said, well, he must not be the Davidic king, even though he keeps saying the kingdom of God is among you, and people kept calling him the son of David. Um, and and you know, John 9, you know, when he heals the blind man, they say, if anyone calls him the Christ, he gets excluded from the simple yeah, yeah. um yeah uh, roman, go ahead a roman catholicism sort of took on that same concept yeah uh, when they they shut the doors of the kingdom per se for the word of god and i think the the, the middle section the persecution of the church uh, from the church when they suppress the church, yeah yeah uh, a lot of people like John Calvin and stuff like that believe that the the church was the Antichrist. They they were a form the of Catholic the, Church yeah. was the Antichrist, and the yeah, what the original Westminster Confession calls the Pope the Antichrist. And when the uh, uh, pilgrims and American settlers came over here, one of the first things they did with the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the things they changed from the Westminster Confession of Faith was where it says the Pope is the Antichrist. So if you look in our Westminster Confession here in America. You won't find that, but if you get a, a, a copy, like you can get, like I've got a, a Scottish version of Confession of Faith, and it calls the Pope the Antichrist. So, yeah, go ahead, Addy. But uh, I, I was going to say that because uh, a lot of people take that wrong, and you know, you, you, you said with that, like, uh, you, they were seeing as the Pharisees did. You know, they were seeing something physical when you know yeah. the the word ecclesia means those called out. Yeah, you right. Know, the, the, uh, like Catholic meaning universal, like, yeah. you know, people take me wrong when I say I am Catholic, but right. I'm not Roman Catholic, but I am part of the universal church. church of yeah, Christ, so. yeah, yeah, good. Thanks, Eddie. Um, yeah, so um, in, in the common view of last things, and that's the word eschatology, last things, and last things from Scripture is, is from Jesus' ascension until his return. Okay, that's last things. Now, 
commonly in the United States, if you say last things, people think, oh, what's still in the future for us? Uh, but uh, the, you know, Peter calls, you know, in the Sermon at Pentecost, the, these last days, you know, and you see that, and Paul says it to Timothy, these last days, and they, they were very fluent in calling, the uh, writer of Hebrews, and calling the days they lived in back in the first century, the last days, or the eschaton, the eschatology, the last days. Um, and so um, if you don't recognize what the New Testament itself is doing, and that's New Testament is answer key. What the New Testament is doing with the Old Testament, for instance, Gog and Magog, or Jesus being the son of David, or Jesus ascending on high, the New Testament tells us, and sitting down at the right hand of God. Uh, or Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and uh, Paul, all these things are in the New Testament and showing us how to interpret the Old Testament. We shouldn't be looking for a geographical 12 tribes kingdom of God today with the son of David sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. The New Testament is very clear. The son of David is sitting on a throne in heaven and that his kingdom is multinational. Go make disciples of all nations. Um, and, and so we follow the New Testament in the way that the New Testament is interpreting the Old Testament. And, and, and you look, read through the book of Acts and you look at Paul as he talks to Jews in the synagogue. Or, for, for instance, when he's talking to Jews in, in um, Rome, when he, finally gets, when he finally gets imprisoned there, um, he said, he, he's arguing to them that Jesus is the Christ from the Scriptures. He argued from the Scriptures, which is the Old Testament, that Jesus was the Christ, meaning the King. The anointed king, the son of David. Um, and, and so um, uh, that's it's very much the, the, uh, what, you, what you see. Um, and, and Paul appeals to uh, Agrippa, uh, King Agrippa, for instance, and says, I'm being persecuted for what we Jews have hoped for all this time. He's not, Paul's not saying, I'm being persecuted because I've left and given up the hope of the Old Testament. He says the hope of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus, and anyone who opposes me from the Jews is opposing what they've hoped for all their lives. That's his argumentation before Agrippa and before, uh, before others as he, as, he speaks in, as he speaks in the Old Testament. Um, so uh, here, here's Paul, uh, Acts 28. Um, he's, he's been imprisoned in Rome, and all the Jews come to him, and he's speaking to his brother Jews, who are not believers in Jesus yet. They're just Jewish people. Uh, verse 9, 28, 19. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. This is, um, uh, this is Paul talking. Uh, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you, Jews, non-Christian Jews in, in Rome, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So Paul is very clear, clearly saying, I am proclaiming the hope of Israel. I'm proclaiming what the Old Testament scriptures were teaching, not something else. You may think, because you've heard, oh yeah, Paul... Yeah, the Jews don't like him, that I've abandoned the faith. And Paul is saying, no, I'm teaching right up the center of our faith. And I'm proclaiming to you the hope that we've had all these years. And those who are against me are, you know, it's crazy. They're against the hope that, they've, that they're saying they're for. Yeah, Bill. In this day and age, people love to portray Jesus as some sort of radical some sort of uh, bringing something new and something weird and different. And he was not. He was bringing the Old Testament to fulfillment. Yeah. He was he's linking himself. Yeah. Absolutely. He's returning people 
to the old road. Yeah. He was not proclaiming yes. a new road. Yeah. He was making all the old come to fruition. Yeah. It just seemed radical because exactly. they yeah. had gotten it wrong. Uh huh. Yeah, it was yeah. radical from their point of view because they were so far off that road. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so, um, yeah, so it, it's tremendously frustrating to the Pharisees as Jesus interacts with them because he's arguing from the scriptures. <laughs> and he makes more sense, as the crowds say. They're amazed at his teaching. He teaches with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. Um, and, and, and so uh, they're, they're, you know, they're very frustrated. They're going around going, <clears throat> you know, after he speaks because he's outdoing them in their own stuff. Um, Okay, um, so uh, back to back to Romans uh, twenty. There, um, we saw in verse nine, fire came down from heaven and devoured them. That's the end of the end of the battle. Revelation twenty. Revelation twenty. Sorry, what did I say? Romans. Yeah, Revelation twenty. Back to Revelation twenty. Um, so that's the end of final battle. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. That is this multinational army. Yeah, go ahead, Manny. I'm, I'm just curious. We're talking about like the metaphor rather than the physical. Yeah. Background. Is the battle also that? Like, is that a physical battle or is that a spiritual yeah. battle as well? We'll know when it comes. It, it seems like it's a, a physical thing. Um, but if it's not, we say, okay, great. Um, because, you know, with metaphor, you're just saying one thing is the other. Um, and so, you know, if you're ever, you know, if you ever have some theological nut with a gun to your head uh, saying, is this a physical, you know, say it's not a physical battle, say it's not a physical battle. <laughs> Don't get shot over that. Um, my I, my my leaning is that is that it is um, you, you do have uh, the because we're coming back to a new heavens and new earth, which is physical. Um, you have Jesus disappearing in Acts 1 in the clouds and the angels saying he will come back and he's still in his physical body, um, that he will come back just as he came. And so it seems to be a physical returning in the clouds. Um, and uh, the, the end of 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning of 1 Thessalonians 5, it seems, it seems that way when we're talking about the return of Christ, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are still alive at that time will rise. And it's talking about physical bodies, because the dead in Christ at that time, when Jesus returns, their souls have been in heaven for who knows how long. So when it says the dead in Christ will rise first, that's talking about their physical bodies. Uh, and so it seems like there's a lot of physical stuff surrounding this uh, final battle. Uh, that's a, it's a great question. Um, it's possible that it's just metaphor, that's metaphorical, the battle is metaphorical. Um, uh, but it seems like there's, there's a lot of a, uh, a case that you can build. This is physical, Jesus comes back physically People are resurrected physically. Um, we wind up in a new heavens and new earth, which is physical. And Jesus comes physically, chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, to live with us. To be, you know, He will live with us, be our God, and, and we'll be his people. Um, so good question. Um, can't pin it down completely, but it seems physical. Yeah, Stacy. Um, were those not a part of God's kingdom or those who Jesus takes as his people if it were not physical would those not a part of that group understand what was going on like if it was just strictly spiritual would they be able to understand that this was like the final battle or I yeah that... I, I think either way they would be yeah uh, and, and what we see uh, in um, like we're at the end of Revelation 6 um, uh, where um, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him 
who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So there's a recognition there among the unbelieving when Jesus comes back that this is, this is the God that I knew, Romans 1, I knew in my heart that he existed and that I owed my all to him and that I've not given it, and this is why I feared death all my life and, and was not relieved of that fear. And, and now I, I'm hiding from that fate, you know, one last time. Yeah, Matthew. So where the Holy Spirit is involved with us recognizing the truth. Yeah. And the Holy, is the Holy Spirit involved in providing this recognition to those who are now 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 wishing for the mountains to fall down on them? We don't know. There's no specific um, uh, in uh, teaching that tells us why they recognize that. I think the closest thing we get to is Romans 1 and 2, that uh, part of the image of God kind of knows the meta story. Yeah, because it seems like if this is a situation of seeing as believing, yeah. why were there so many non-believers when they saw Jesus? Mm -hmm. So it, it just seems, I mean, don't build a church on it. It just seems like there's a, a, yeah. some sort of a, you know, spiritual awakening that goes on. And I hate that term because I, I don't mean like in the sense of like... Yeah, okay. well, let, let me, let me uh, pull that out a little yeah. bit. You're bringing up a good point. Um, so now to see spiritually, you do need the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that a bunch during the uh, gospel lesson this morning. Um, and if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not seeing and you're not hearing. Uh, but the reason that's so important is because um, Jesus is invisible right now. Um, and even when Jesus was doing miracles, you could explain it away or just suppress the truth. Um, and, and, you know, like I was, I was listening to, um, did that show up for you guys? Um, uh, uh, Pat, oh, what's her name from Saturday Night Live? Who knows the actress's name? Julia. Uh, no. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Anyway, <laughs> she was a cast member on Saturday Night Live in the, in the early 90s. Julia Sweeney, and, and um, she's now an atheist. She grew up Catholic, which is a lot of what happens. A lot of atheists used to be Catholics, and they're seeing the things that the Catholic Church taught was true that aren't in the Bible, and they figured out those things that the Catholic Church said were true that weren't in the Bible aren't true, and then therefore they've thrown out the whole baby with the bathwater. And so she was talking about her, her uh, atheism, and... Um, she said, you know, I, I even, you know, had a, a real spiritual time. She wanted to be a nun when she was in high school. But then even uh, uh, later in her life, um, she, she saw in her 20s that, you know, God is really working. And, and she th thought of she wasn't a believer, but she just believed that this was true. And then she started thinking about it and she started saying, but there were physical explanations for all those things as I came to think of those things. Um, you know, like, so you could come up with a physical explanation perhaps for why all the, the Nile river was red and looked like blood and was blood. Um, you can come up for a reason why the blind man now sees maybe he got hit on the back of his head. You know, you, you can do that. And, and just, you know, that's what, uh, the liberal theological liberalism of the 1700s did. They started saying, Jesus, this is literally true uh, of um, a guy named, uh, I think it was Adolf von Har Harnock, uh, said um, Jesus wasn't walking on water. He was walking on a sandbar and his disciples were a certain distance away and it looked like he was walking on water, but he, he just never cleared that up with them. Or, or that uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000, this is early theological liberalism of the 1700s, Jesus feeding the 5,000 was that the people already had fish and bread in their purses and backpacks, but they weren't willing to share. And the miracle was that Jesus was such a charismatic personality, he made everybody be generous and say, okay, I've got some bread here. And then when they finally, when everyone was satiated, they finally collected all the bread and fish, and it was like more than 
the five loaves, you know, the, the, whatever it was, seven loaves and five fish, you know, it's different at different feedings. Yeah. What's that? Five loaves, two fish. Yeah. Um, and so that was the real miracle that Jesus made people be generous. Um, so, you know, physical explanations and, and, and so, um, so you need faith now, you need the Holy Spirit now to say, no, God worked there. Um, but when Jesus is physically in front of you and you're physically going through um, final judgment and your sins are being named from the books that were opened, um, you, you have to admit there, there's, there's no, no uh, plan around. Yeah. As if God would not use his own creation to accomplish it. Yeah. But in, if you were to also acknowledge that God would use his own creation, then certainly he could break the, the physical rules to yes. also. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just real stupid. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, you know, just tying in with, yeah, absolutely. And tying in with, you know, the, the miracles that Jesus did, often the miracles were showing himself as God. Who can create matter? John 1, 1 through 3, right? Nothing has been created but through the word Jesus who came to earth to be among us. And so when Jesus, you know, creates bread and fish, that's him doing what he did in Genesis 1 in the beginning. Um, he said, let there be fish. Let there be bread. And there was bread and there was fish. That's what Jesus is showing, but it's not just a neat miracle that he fed everybody. He is doing something only God can do um, and create matter uh, where matter didn't from from nothing. Breaking the rules of thermodynamics. Breaking the rules of thermodynamics, yeah, which he established for the regularity of life. Which again um, is the great irony: nothing can break those rules, but something had to bring those rules into existence. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, okay. Um, so good, good questions. Good questions there. Um, so let's just uh, run through these things. So, um, let's see, uh, Christina, can you read this bullet? Yeah. At the consummation, the second coming. Okay. And Mary Lane, can you read this second bullet for us? Okay, so we just went through seven through ten. Um, let's let's go ahead and read nineteen through twenty-one. And so, uh, Manny, can you read nineteen for us? This is chapter nineteen, uh, verse nineteen. Just that verse. Just that verse. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to mark to make war against the rider on the horse. Okay, right, so reminder: who's the rider on his horse from earlier in the chapter? Jesus, yeah, he's got King of Kings, Lord of Lords written on his thigh there. He's got a you know crown, and you know it's the the white horse from Revelation six two. Um, and and so, what does this sound like in chapter nineteen that we've just read a little bit ago? Yeah, final battle, chapter twenty. Um, uh, so you see here, it's just, and this is how Revelation works. This is how prophets work in the Old Testament. You talk about the same thing over and over from different angles. Like one of those movies or TV shows that shows you the same order of events from a different perspective. And then it goes back again and then shows you the same, like NBC Boomtown, which lasted for two years and was a great show, but got canceled. It would do that. It'd run through the same whatever murder scenario or whatever from the viewpoint of four different characters. And each time you'd get a little bit more information because you were seeing or hearing some conversation that you hadn't heard, you know, that was part of the first characters, whatever. And so this is how prophecy works in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets are doing this constantly. But you see that the book of Revelation is just a New Testament prophetic book. And this sentence, verse 19, kings of the earth, uh, their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. And then you can see uh, verse 8 of chapter 20, and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Um, 
Verse 9, they marched across the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. Okay, so same thing going on. It's just that, that uh, prophecy does this, gives us different angles. Um, all right, verse verse 20. Crystal, would you read verse 20 of chapter 19, 1920? But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Okay, so the lake of fire there, the, the beast and and uh, um, the, the false prophet, this is the sea beast and the land beast, um, talks about how they, whatever these, you know, miracles are, whatever, it's, you know, it's what caused the world to just follow them against the church. Um, and then uh, 21, Laura. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on them. Okay, so final battle, led by Jesus, uh, Jesus with his army following him per uh, 19, 9 through 10 there um, uh, against um, the the um, sea beasts and land beasts. Sea beasts being what? The governments. Yeah, the governments of the world. So it makes sense. You know, king, of the land kings of the earth. And then the land beast is the same thing as the, the false prophet. Um, so anything that would promote government above God. Okay, so government's the solution, all your problems, government's what meets your needs, all that kind of thing. And so we always want to be careful about that. Um, in whatever country we live in, if someone starts saying government will meet your needs, if a politician or a king or whatever will say, look to me for your needs being met. Um, uh, that's that's uh, certainly the, the message of the land of the land beast in the um, book of Revelation. It's the land beast is the false prophet or the promoter of the sea beast which is the governments of the world and that through scripture tends to be the um the thing that takes people away from following the one true god and looking to him to meet all their to meet all their needs this is why god doesn't allow alliances in old testament israel he says you look to me to meet your needs even if the army coming against you appears like the sands of the seashore, look to me and I'll rescue you. You're not permitted to go form an alliance with some other country to have their army come and help you. Okay, um, Don't look to governments, you know, or as the psalmist says, you know, we don't trust in, in princes or armies or horses or chariots, but our trust is in the name of the Lord our God who delivers us. Okay. Um, and so that's what we see in final battle. You know, our God that we've looked to delivers us from the, the great you know, nations that have come against us and been against us who are in the church, part of Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of the Son of David. Okay. Um, and then uh, next bullet, Bob. And while a faithful Israel post-exile could have had a 100% victorious war against the world's gathered against them in Ezekiel 38.5. It didn't in part due to their unfaithfulness to the church at the second coming of the world. Okay, so there's this 100% victorious war of the church at the second coming, just like, uh, just like Ezekiel talked about, uh, had that multinational army come against Israel in its um, restored state under a new son of David. See, and we are the church's Israel in its restored state under the new son of David, which is Jesus. Okay. And then uh, last thing here uh, as we break. Um, and so, Charlene. Similarly, God's people will battle the gathered army of the world. Revelation 20, verses 10 to 7 to 10. All the people who are not part of God's holy nation, the church. Okay, so the church, 1 Peter 2, 9, is called God's holy nation, and uh, we battle uh, in that final battle um, the gathered army of the world uh, and have this uh, uh, splendid um, uh, splendid victory over them with the, uh, the devil who deceived them, verse, uh, verse 10 of chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them, 
uh, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, same thing as the lake of fire, uh, where the beast, the governments of the world, false prophet, those who supported them, had been thrown. They'll be torment, tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, so utter victory. Um, Satan, governments of the world, gathering people unto themselves for their own glory in contradistinction from God, to, toward God's glory. Thrown into the lake of fire, sealed up forever, never to bother us again um, as we live in the new heavens and new earth. Okay, so 100% victory. Um, never will see them again. Okay, good. Um, let's let's pray, and then we'll break and uh, have some fellowship, and then gather together and worship in about ten minutes. Let's pray.